Like I was saying, my name is Liana Sananda, and I help to run development for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, also known as MAPS. Yeah, give it up for MAPS. So MAPS has curated the speaker series here at Burning Man for all of your enjoyment. We are also running the Zendo Project, providing psychedelic harm reduction and peer support for individuals having difficult or challenging experiences with psychedelics or mental health in general. So we're really happy to be here, be at Burning Man. It's been such an incredible opportunity to bring this speaker series forward. And I just want to shout out my girl Andy. Is she in the room right now? She's not even in here. There she is. Andy, everyone please put your hands together over here for Andy. She is the queen that has made all of this possible, obviously with the help of the whole team, but she's really been holding it down, so super grateful for Andy. So next up, I'm so excited to introduce to you Android Jones, who likely doesn't need much of an introduction. He is a digital alchemist, a brilliant visionary artist. He's working across medi mediums. He has created a 360 visual experience called Samsara with the team out of Thailand. He's also, yeah, he's also working on some incredible VR applications and he's a, a wonderful human, brilliant philosopher and I'm excited to hand it off to Android Jones. Uh, thank you so much. No. Thank you so much, Liana. Um, thanks for everyone that made this dome possible and uh, everyone's generous support and thanks for all your attention coming out. Um, it's always excited, excites me to be able to connect and share the things I'm thinking about with, uh, with the people. Um, this, is, uh, this is burn number 17 in a row. Uh, brought my family out this year, so I've got my lovely wife Martha and our two little burners, uh, Nova Escher. Nova's two and a half. This is her third burn. Woo! Escher's <laughs> crushing it. Escher is uh, one years old, and he's totally raging. They're the most they're the most beautiful art project I could think of bringing to the playa. I know it is. <laughs> and. Uh, other than that, I'm kind of, uh, we kind of alternate our Burning Man years as far as what we do, what we're sharing, and um, what we're working on. This is definitely like a, an R&D year for uh, our research and dissociation with our VR ketamine project. I guess that's what, that's what they listed as the title for this talk. So we got 20 minutes to talk and like 10 minutes for questions, so I'm just going to talk about that for 20 minutes. Um, Initial tests are positive, which is great. Uh, yeah, we're really, you know, this is the, this is the, the tip of the spear um, right now for the, the type of work that uh, we're doing. Around three years ago, I started into, I kind of got exposed to the world of VR and the medium and was really able to see the potential that it holds now and that it can hold for our future and being a medium that I'm pretty confident that my children will be immersed in um, as they grow up. So it's something I wanted to kind of get into as early as possible to really be able to kind of just feel the edges. And um, I'm really excited by any type of tool that offers humans the ability to share more of their thoughts and their feelings and gives a platform for uh, creativity. Um, Little about me, you may not know. Uh, I am very, I am very fortunate. I come from a, a genetic background of creative privilege. Uh, on my father's side, they, uh, my my grandfather and great grandfather, held down and operated a pharmacy in Boulder, Colorado, for a hundred and two years, called Jones Drug. So pharmacists, chemists on one side. My mom's side, the, uh, the lion Zamboni side, my great uncle Peter Zamboni, invented the Zamboni machine. You know, it's a pretty dope art car, if you look at it. I mean, it's a, it's a total mutant vehicle. The first one was an army Jeep, the second one was a Volkswagen. They still use Volkswagen, it just so, 
we got drugs and art cars, you know, an invention. And so, you know, it seems pretty obvious that going into the field of digital drugs and inventing new ways to experience them would be something right up my alley. And that's the, that's the dharma that I've, I've chosen to, to go down, which is, uh, and uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been like a total rabbit hole in the last three years. So really it's the kind of the transition from, in the past, a lot of people, you guys probably know my work from like the two-dimensional digital images. Um, I started off as a traditional artist, you know, crayons, markers, went through the whole spectrum of different mediums until I was in college, got my hands on a Wacom in 96, saw that that was a, a new trajectory to take. You know, Ken Wilber talks about that he has one of my his favorite sort of isms is the idea of like transcending and including, you know, that's how we kind of move forward. So my strategy has always been to take the best aspects from art history, the techniques, uh, the lessons that artists spent their whole lifetime trying to contribute to the future and take those and include them within our modern kind of pantheon of tools available. And uh, I'm a, for anybody that knows me, I'm just a tool fiend. It's my favorite thing. Sometimes I tell people that, you know, in the spectrum of like, why come to Burning Man between like, you know, your, the apotheosis of your divine self discovering itself and like the lower spectrum, which is, you know, at the very, at, at, at his base level, Burning Man is the, it's the best enabler and excuse that I have for spending thousands of dollars at Home Depot and doing drugs with my friends, you know? It, it can be that simple, people, you know? You don't need to dress it up. It's, I'm totally okay, full respect if that's why you like coming out here. That's, uh, at the end of the day, that's one of my excuses. But yeah, I love all types of tools, power tools, electric tools, fire tools. Um, there's something about when I see a tool, I feel that it's, it's the material extension of my consciousness into the molecular world of manifestation. Um, it's a multiplier of the, the gifts and the opportunities that we have as human beings to have a direct effect in the world that, that we live in. So I'm always excited when it, there's the opportunity to, to use a new tool, to learn about a new tool, to figure out what it does and how I, that can be benefiting any of the, uh, the agendas or needs that I have and I kind of offer more value there. And what's, I think what's kind of entranced me about the world of VR and what's kind of kept me in this rabbit hole for three years is within this type of software, the group and the, the company I've started, it's, it's, a, it's a level of, there's an experience that we can create with this but it also has enabled us to be able to make, it's a tool that is capable of almost, it's like a meta tool. You can like make a tool within it. Um, when you make a painting and someone gets value out of that painting, you know, they're, what they're really attracted to is the experience that painting gives them. You know, I'd like to think that when someone connects with a piece of work that I'm making, they're not only connecting with a reflection of themselves they see in it that attracts them to it, but they're also somehow connecting with the experience that I had when I created that image. Um, the experience of making a piece of art is my kind of number one highest level uh, juice. It's just like, it's just the spice of life for me. And with our, with our microdose project, the, the main, one of the, the guiding sort of roles was making a, you know, this piece of art that gave people the experience of being creative. That was kind of our first uh, high level goal, you know, cause it, there's like a meta level, there's experiencing someone else's creative experience or being able to have your own experience within that. And so from there, we've worked on the microdose. Uh, this is all done. This is like a video, just a video we captured within, within microdose. Um, it's, 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 we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about, you know, what works, what doesn't, kind of taking into account 
We've been using Burning Man, I think 2016 was the first year we brought out the Burning Man. We've been bringing it out to festivals as our main sort of test subject group. You know, seeing the things people are responding to, looking at like the friction points, what do people kind of want to see in it, where does it need to go. And um, we've had a lot of success with that. And it was, as we, we have kind of two branches of the, the project. We have one that's this, uh, it's an exponent that can kind of awaken, the, it's like the gateway drug to your inner creative spirit, music, dancing, synesthesia aspect. And the, the other one that we've been working with kind of covertly has been on the side of the, uh, the health and healing um, therapeutic VR. You know, there's one thing that, you know, I can think that when I look at this room and I look out in this, this beautiful event, if there's, if I were to make a guess, if there's one thing that really bonds all of us together, if there's some sort of connective tissue, it's our trauma, you know. Nobody comes here unless you're hurting deeply from something. Healthy people, like healthy people that don't need anything, don't lug all of their shit out into the middle of the desert to do drugs with strangers. It's not healthy behavior. It really isn't. It's fun. It's a great way of healing. It's, you know, I've done it for 17 years, so, so far I think it's, it's, it's working. Um, but I think as artists, it's really important to look at, um, if you want to, I tell like young artists that ask me for advice, if you're looking to make art your livelihood, you need to find a way that it offers an experience that's valuable to other people. You know, and I think that everybody can find value in something that can be a, a healing tool. When I look at the technology of VR and beyond kind of the, you know, like the catchphrases and the immersiveness and the interaction and 360 when you, you know, it's, it's basically two phones, like, you know, Velcroed to your head with some controllers. You know, it's not that complicated, but what makes it special is the synthesis of all of these different technologies that are coming together at the same time. It's the headsets, it's particularly the, it's the CPUs, it's the graphics cards. Um, I won't get into too technical jargon, but it's, a, it's an incredible time to be alive as a digital artist seeing the, this, the, the, the coherence of all these things coming together. And when I think of mediums, one of uh, my favorite authors is Marshall McLuhan. He wrote this book, The Medium is the Massage, which is it's kind of like a standard fare, you know, art school, art, art school kind of 101 reading material. And what he looks at, when he looks at every medium, he, he kind of has one statement that, the, that what's created within the medium is almost of, of little consequence. It's like, what is the medium saying in itself? You know, you look at the telegram, the messages that got sent back and forth of the telegram are, are, are not as important as the impact the telegram had like on World War I of communication. Like what's the meta narrative of this? And I think of what, the meta, what he would have said about VR. Um, he talked often how these new mediums, they're extensions of our central nervous system. And so when I think of it with the VR and the graphics cards, what they're enabling on a larger scale that we've never had before is that the technology is reaching a point with this, the real time technology would be the biggest innovation. Like when I went to school in 96, you had to render 10 seconds of video for 16 hours. And now we get 90 frames a second of, of, of work that's higher quality than what we got you know, two decades ago. And with this real time technology enables, I feel when I look at part of the value of art, is we find, we often find a piece of art meaningful and valuable when we look into it and an aspect of it like reflects a deeper part of ourselves. You know, art is, uh, it can be a mirror that we see new aspects of ourselves, see parts of ourselves that we want to see, um, or even see parts of our shadow that we weren't willing to see before. And the technology is at the point where I believe it's getting to we can have, it's enabling a real-time digital reflection of ourselves that we've never had the opportunity to experience before. Um, I was, uh, uh, Rick Doblin came over to our laboratory last night and I was giving him a little tour of the software and I, 
I kind of realized two, it was 2017 at the MAPS conference in Oakland. Anybody go to that conference? It was awesome. Yep. Um, we had a real, we had a, we had a really, a, a breakthrough at that conference because I gave a workshop and uh, one of the attendees is a gentleman named Chris Amwan, who's the founder of the Muse headband. And he had flown out to, from Toronto to come to the, the workshop to meet me. And he gave us this, this prototype that he was working on, which was a, it was a face mask, uh, a VR headset face mask with a infrared, green infrared laser on it that plugged into the headset that from the, your kind of your occipital bone, it could take your heartbeat and your pulse in real time from the blood between you know, your cheek and your cheekbone. And what we do with, uh, within our company with Microdose is we can make data accessible and immersive and um, three-dimensional and sexy. So instead of just numbers or graphs, we can express it in a multitude of, of physically tangible ways. And what we've been doing with that is we find that really honing in, we've, got, we've, we've been working with some EEG and some alpha waves and theta waves. They're, they're a bit more abstract, but just kind of focusing in on the heart is something that we found, uh, it's been incredibly powerful just to be in VR and to sit with a, you know, a pulsing particle that's in tune in real time with your own heart. You know, I think that when I think about when I talk to a lot, been, we've been doing a lot of research and talking to several different types of therapists that have been working in the ketamine space. And one of the consistent narratives that we've heard when we kind of ask them, like, what are you trying to, you know, I'm a big fan of like John C. Lilly and his use of ketamine to um, reprogram his own brain, you know, to be able to create, use that place of disassociation and to implant you know, new, new, new software, new ideas to kind of get rid of, of things that are not serving anymore. And um, when, I, when I was talking to them about what are the ideas that you think are the most important that you're, you're trying to, to overlay into what's already existing. And across the board, it seems that one of the, the most important things that helps with whether it's depression or whether it's like an autoimmune disease is the idea of being able to love oneself. I mean, that's really at the core until you can replace that software of understanding how to love yourself, which is so much more difficult than it sounds. I mean, I think everyone at some point really struggled. I've struggled with that my whole life. Um, the reason I, I have an incredible body of work that everyone enjoys is because for years I didn't know how to love myself and I was using art as a proxy to try to gain the, the appreciation of others that I was unable to give to myself, you know. We all do it in sneaky ways. Um, but one of our goals within Microdose and our, and our, 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 our the healing aspect of our software, ketamine or non-ketamine related, is to give people, create a new visual relationship with the invisible aspects of themselves that are at the core of what's supporting our organism, you know, and I don't think it can get more directly than your heart, you know, not to anthropomorphize it too much, but I mean, your heart's been there from day one. Everyone in this room, your heart's never given up on you. You know, it's one of the most beautiful muscles we have. And so to be able to like meet your heart for the first time and see it in real time, the theory that we had um, of like why to introduce ketamine. Um, it's funny, I got, I was really into ketamine from like 2000, probably 2008 to 2010. I went pretty deep in that rabbit hole. Um, a little too deep probably. And, um, but I was able to emerge to tell the tale. But something that I always found really fascinating about it was the dissociative nature. Um, and I always used it when I was making a piece of artwork because as I went into the creative experience on a pretty heroic amount of ketamine, I was able to disassociate from all of the, you know, the, the inner critic and the judgment and the ego and my whole sense of identity. And I was left just kind of surfing like the pure creative spirit without any relationship to myself, but all the muscle memories of like how to use a Wacom and how to paint something, that was all it could, it could it could uh, take advantage of that, that programming already. 
And so our, our theory on where it would be valuable to introduce ketamine into the VR experience is what well, our working prototype right now is you kind of sit down, it's kind of lay back in a comfortable chair, you're seated, your hands are at your side, and we've created a, uh, well, it's kind of like a, a portal, a uh, sense. It's kind of made of just small little white kind of uh, dodecahedrons of geometry. And as you enter into it, it starts to spawn and pulse to your heart rate at kind of whatever vibration you're at. And as we have a series of tools that we've made with the iPad that allows the therapist to, you can kind of go forward into the experience, you can change the pulsation. Uh, we use these uh, really beautiful polar math coordinates to create from a one petal lotus to a two, to a five, up to a, I don't know what the top, what 32 petal lotuses five minutes that you're going through. And um, the theory that we've been working with is that if you can create this experience of kind of going, traveling through, um, and as the ketamine ramps up, as you, you, you know that this is your heart rate, you know, you're, that's something that's been told to you ahead of time, but if you can get to a point of dissociation where you get so entranced with the experience that you lose sight of yourself to the dissociation where this pulsing mandala that you're traveling backwards and forward with, uh, we can change the different gradients of the colors and the shapes and the intensity based off some of the biometric data that we're seeing and just based off just responding to what the patient is experiencing, that by disassociating themselves with it as they kind of as their, as their identity starts to reconfigure and they remember and become aware that the center of this profound experience was their own heartbeat. You know, there's the moment, there's the opening for the therapist to insert whatever love yourself, propaganda, their best line, their best, you know, zinger right there as you ground out. And we feel that within the, the different sessions that therapists use from the five sessions, the other big problem they're having is, you know, people are obviously um, for antidepression, they're getting addicted to ketamine. It was spoiler alert, you know, who's, who saw that coming, right? <laughs> ketamine would not have been my first choice for, an, for treating depression, but, you know, we work with, you know, what's available right now. Um, but we also believe that if we can anchor, if someone's never done VR or ketamine before, we theorize that we have the ability to anchor their profound ketamine therapy experience within the context of the VR, and hopefully that after they go through their five sessions um, and the ketamine prescription runs out, which it should, because it's not, it's, it's not your friend in the long term, you know, trust someone, I've gone through all the paces, you know. Ketamine, you don't want to be, developing too deep of a relationship with it, um, that afterwards people can, can work on self-care with just the VR with... I think we're running out of batteries on this one. And that the, oof, and that the, uh, the VR becomes an anchor to their experience so they can then work to heal themselves because ultimately we would, you know, it, it, would, it would be great to find some way with what I, what I like about the idea of the digital drugs is, you know, and the big, the big long term would be to, you know, compete and, you know, put the pharmaceutical industry out of business. If we can create tools that enable us to procedurally heal ourselves by having a deeper relationship and connection with ourselves through the technology, which is part of Mother Earth that we've created in order to grow and learn and share new ideas and evolve, then uh, that's where we want to steer the ship, and that's where we're going. So, yeah, that's about it. Thank you guys very much. All right, so we got about 10 minutes for questions. So please raise your hand if you have a question. All right, all the way back, give us a shout, and we'll repeat the question. Have we considered the guided visualization? Yeah, we have. Um, 
one of the therapists we work with is like a Jungian therapist. And so we've talked to him about creating a set of sort of archetypal tools that he can then going on a hero's quest, like conjuring up these different, different imagery at different moments um, within his therapy. And what's interesting about it in a conversation I got with Rick too, or looking at the places that VR is effective and non-effective, um, Rick had some hesitation around like the PTSD because so much about that is, I guess the, the argument is what's more valuable within a, uh, from a, if you want to cite on the therapeutic or the scientific, from a, a scientific arena, being able to test uh, a thousand people with the exact same VR visual stimulus is more valuable for getting accurate data. Uh, but Rick was, uh, he was positioning that the benefits of what really helps people for PTSD is being able to recall that exact moment in your imagination. And, you know, I am, I'm not foolish enough to think that any type of technology could ever rival the power of human imagination and the rendering potential of our, our internal, you know, brain-based graphics cards. But I do feel that what I found is that even though, you know, within even the experience I've had so far, even if the, I'm completely immersed by the, if, the, if, the, if my visual feedback um, circuits are totally immersed with these patterns and colors, we try to keep everything like pretty objectively like non-referential. This, you know, we're basically like a, advanced color therapy company. But just looking at the geometry and the colors, I find that I'm still able to, if anything, it takes a lot of any pressure off me and all the randomness that I might see when I close my eyes. And it gives me some sort of structure. And I find that it actually frees my mind and frees some of the bandwidth for the, like the meaning making machine of my imagination to overlay on top of it. Um, but yeah, I think that the idea of uh, more sort of having relationships with therapists and curated type of hero's journey type of content would be really, uh, could be valuable. Oh yeah, yeah, eye tracking technology. We have a, actually one of the guys, their question was just um, in regards to some of the eye tracking technology. I mean, the most exciting thing about kind of being at the tip of the spear of these type of innovations is there, is a, there are new, new forms of, of new, new hardware coming out all the time. So there's a new, like even Vive has like an iRes, like a, it's more of a prosumer grade, $1,500 $1, headset that does do the eye tracking, we've talked to them, and it can even do, it can even read like your pupil dilation, you know, which would be incredibly valuable for like a, a calibration element. I mean, ultimately, what we have right now works really well when you have a therapist that's trained in the software that can guide it along, but the vision that we have is, you know, having a, I don't know, maybe five years in the future, depending how fast this legalization I don't know, it's weird, but like the site, I have this version, some out of this dream, it was like in China, and you're just sitting in like, there's a chair at the airport, you know, like those kind of like heat lamp things that come over, and this thing just kind of comes up, I mean, we kind of want to design this so when like the, the Starbucks of like self-healing, you know, economy emerges, and you've got five minutes, and you know, the headset just comes over, and it just like, you know, some type of like encephalated, ketamine mist like enters your system it's like a it's like a mini tune-up you know the more we if we can proceed if we want to make this as procedurally generated as possible to ultimately affect the the most amount of people so i don't know that's just like a philip k dick fever dream i had or some vision of the future but you know you got to have some sort of guiding light to steer your ship towards Yeah, well, so, 
you know, we have a lot of theories. We have a lot of things just, that we Just we've, to repeat the question. Oh, sorry, yeah. the question. Have we thought a lot of some, some of the some v people have been doing a lot of VR work and see the potential of VR and empathy, and have we thought about that? Um, w the, the immediate thing that comes to mind is one of our like, potential projects that I would see value in is the, like, I, I, li I really like the idea of almost like a group VR therapy session. Um, my wife and I have benefited a lot from uh, like couples therapy together. And uh, I just imagine what it would be like to have all three people in VR, but for the therapist to be having, what, I mean, these, this is stuff that we have already that no, doesn't need any like, oh, if they build the thing, the therapist can easily see all the biometrics of both people. Like we want to give therapists an x-ray vision into the body signals of their patients in order to even better understand like when does, is there a heart palpitation at some point? You know, she can see the stress levels of one, of, of one person before it, like, you know, the, the underpinnings of the emotions before, as the emotions are happening, will give them deeper insight into the individual. But one of the, what we also do with our, 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 our current uh, VR ketamine system is there's a, forgot to mention, there's like a, a sub pack, uh, like base system that's kind of in the chair strapped to their back that's echoing your own heartbeat to you. And uh, we haven't tried this out yet, but I think if you did a couples therapy and each of the, the man or the woman would have like, or man or man or woman or woman, don't mean to uh, have be non-binary. If they could, ex you could, we have, create, we have the technology to almost exchange the heartbeats between them. If you could feel your own heart and then you could not only like interchange your visual input with each other, but you could also be feeling the other person's heart as they were feeling your heart and working on exercises that would help both people come into a sense of like heart coherence with each other. I think that'd be just a really powerful way just to start a therapy session. You know, we're no, at this stage, we're not looking for any silver bullets or cures. We're really looking at creating, I wanna be a tool maker that creates tools for this technology that give that can amplify uh, the intelligence and the the work that talented therapists are already working with so we have time for one more question there's one right up here hi I was wondering what the uh, benefits of uh, artists created or therapists created visuals uh, to create that mirror for for patients is uh, w better than or different from uh, like ayahuasca or other plant-based medicines that create that where you self-create visuals that can create that same mirror. Yeah, um, you know, I would like. We don't have any intentions of trying to put ayahuasca out of business with what we're doing. You know, we'd like to. <laughs> we would really like to, you know, work in harmony with the different methods, and. Um, like I said, I'm not foolish enough to think that technology could ever rival the technology of a plant that has the ability that once ingested to go deep inside your own subconscious and conjure up real-time panoramas of visual narratives designed to teach you a lesson. Like, we're <laughs> the technology is not there yet, guys. We're a long way away. So mad respect to Ayahuasca and the plant kingdom for all they can offer. Um, what we'd like to do is to be a, we would like to be a complementary aspect of that. And we would like to use technology. And one of the beautiful things technology does is it makes, it makes the invisible visible. We have an incredible amount of data that's happening within our bodies all the time that's, you know, our bodies don't, they don't lie, they don't hide the truth from us, they don't obscure, you know, it's as honest as it gets. And, you know, with, uh, you know, like Plato, like the, one of the goals in life is to know thyself. And so if we can use technology and this new immersive medium to get deeper insights and form a relationship with ourselves, you know, our heartbeat, our alpha, our theta waves, to form that bond and be able to then, once we can see that connection, to then, by with the power of our own will be able to modulate and change and mirror and amplify and tune ourselves into the frequencies objective frequencies not hippy dippy i'm so activated right now but like you'll get we've got data we've got little readouts that tell you when 
your heartbeat's incoherence and not. It's, 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 it's binary. We want to get to that binary place because it's very hard to quantify the visions you have on ayahuasca uh, versus having an experience that we can measure. We can measure your biometrics. We can then test and then you know, record and track the data over long periods of time. And there's way less puking and shitting yourself while you're doing it too, right? I hate that part. That part sucks. Right? On that note, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Android Jones. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much.